All right, as uh, I was introduced, my name is Jacob Torrey. Uh, this is my talk on playing games with chimeras. Um, so thank you everyone for being here. I know it's rather early, especially if you're coming in from further west like me, it's even earlier. Um, also, very much thanks to all of our sponsors who make this possible. And again, thanks everyone to come out here. I know there's a lot of cool stuff going on here. There's villages, there's other talks, there's people to talk about talk to, you know, friends you can meet, uh, and so I appreciate you guys, at least for now, you know, as you see the talk, you'll probably get up and leave, but at least for now, I appreciate you for coming to my talk, so uh, I'll have another thank you for those who stay all the way through at the end, so you can look forward to that. So diving right in, the kind of thesis or the people who are going to take notes and then go back and tell their friends what they saw, this is what really what, what it's all about, is that we live in a world now of unbridled complexity and Basic attackers or clever attackers have turned into these mythical beasts we call hackers or malicious hackers, especially in the news. And I think that what I'd like to say is that it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom. We can attack these mythical beasts at any scale of resources. And uh, I'll get into that a little bit um, when I go into my background. So kind of first, uh, um, I live in southwestern Colorado, so it's uh, one hour earlier for me, so the coffee is, is kicking in. Thanks for... Thanks for that coffee. Um, I had quite the trip over here yesterday. Uh, some of the things I like to do for fun, um, well, sort of fun, I put out fires. Not for fun, but it's pretty good. Uh, for fun, I do like to go skiing um, and ice climbing in the winter, and then trail running in the summer. More probably relevant to this crowd. Uh, I've had kind of a career that's let me kind of see both ends of the spectrum in terms of scale of resources. So when I started working, you know, it was just me, individual contributor, kind of intern, um, and I worked my way up to leading a smallish team, you know, at, at a company called Assured Information Security. Um, and then I went from that kind of small scale to very large scale. Uh, I was at DARPA as a program manager, um, so that's a, a much bigger thing. If you've never heard of DARPA, um, you could ask Siri, which was invented at DARPA, or look it up on the internet, which was invented by DARPA, um, or you could look up where it is on Google Maps using GPS, which was also invented by DARPA. So, they do some cool stuff there, um, and I was really privileged to be part of that. I then spent about a, a year at AWS uh, managing some security teams there, uh, and now I'm at Thinkst, which no one's probably heard of, but they've probably heard of Canaries. Um, so I run their new labs group, uh, which is just me. So now I'm at the smallest scale, which is basically like one deadbeat engineer myself. So if someone wants to come and double the size or triple the size of my team, please let me know. So, just kind of roughly, I think we were like, at, my team was maybe $2 million a year in budget at AIS. And then I was like 200, 300 million a year at DARPA um, that I was personally able to kind of direct. AWS, a lot of compute resources. I mean, we had this thing called the cloud that we could use and it was really fun kind of seeing how much my boss was getting billed for us using things to do fuzzing at scale. Um, but uh, not that much in terms of human resources, pretty small team still. And then, you know, things is like maybe a pity half dollar there uh, of me and getting to play around with stuff. So, um, this is kind of an interesting thing and so this is going to be something where I want to say that we can do interesting work at all different scales, whether or not you're an individual person working on a beat up Chromebook to, you know, pretty rich country that spends a lot of money on defense. Um, you can play in different places, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about, how you can still be effective at whatever scale you have. And also, at the end of the day, money doesn't necessarily mean value, right? Uh, I feel like I've gotten more free credit monitoring in the last couple years than I ever have before. I think at this point, I don't think I'll ever have to pay for free credit monitoring. Um, and ransomware are really starting to get into impacting daily life, right? So, banks, I have money, some and that gets impacted. You know, meat, that's a, something pretty important. I mean, we heard that talk earlier about the steak. If we can't get steak because ransomware, that's a pretty sad world. You know, gasoline is also pretty important. Um, I'm not too sad about insurance companies that go on the record saying how people who get ransomware are idiots and then get ransomware. So that one's just kind of funny. <laughs> And then this one I didn't make, really doesn't make sense. I mean, why would you ransomware a computer company? Because then you can't ransomware the people who buy those computers and use those computers. But I guess they're making money anyway, so we're not really doing that well, I guess, uh, is kind of the, the 
point of that. So, what's going on? And here's a little bit of audience participation. Don't worry, there's no wrong answers. So, the physical world has physical limits. And we've pretty much become to understand this, right? If I take this water bottle and I drop it, who here thinks it will fall to the ground? Show of hands. There are some anti-gravity people here. That is, <laughs> you are entitled to your belief. It's actually, in this case, not really harming anyone, so I'd much rather you be anti-gravity than anti-other things. So, I think that these physical laws and the, the expectations and when we live in a physical world is like a speed limit on complexity, which is actually a good thing, right? Simplicity and predictability allows us to create amazing things and it allows us to generalize knowledge, right? I don't need to write like a mathematical formula or you don't need to see me drop this exact water bottle onto the stage to understand that it's probably gonna happen. You can generalize because you probably all drop something probably heavy and it probably hit your toe at some point in your life. And so you've learned that lesson and now you're pretty good at that, right? And really we've lived for many, many eons with these constraints, right? Without them though, Designing a building even could be a near impossible task. So I like this picture, MC Escher, a famous Dutch illustrator, is showing this kind of infant staircase. And without the physical world and the physical constraints, you could probably build this. And people who have ever looked at code that someone else has written, they've definitely seen this building written in code. Something that should not ever have existed, and you want to burn it down. And then you look up and you realize, oh crap, I wrote that code three years ago, and I'm an idiot. Definitely done that, and it's always Perl. Sorry. <laughs> so, unfortunately, system today, I mean, all systems, right? You can think of that in a very generic, any scale, no longer encumbered by these physical laws, right? They have near limitless complexity. Uh, Mike Walker, who ran Cyber Grand Challenge, had this great, great quote that software tells a CPU what not to do rather than telling its computer what to do. So, you think about it, the CPU could be in almost any state and the software is trying to say, please stay over here, and then the attackers are saying, please go over here. Um, and they're also more interconnected than ever before. I mean, healthcare, meat, computers, everything is connected. Um, I just give credit, so Thomas Dillian, also Halber Flake, gave a great uh, talk on complexity and the economics of complexity at SciCon, which is like a NATO cybersecurity conference in Estonia a couple years ago, definitely worth checking out. Um, much smarter than me, uh, so in case this one is piqued your curiosity, but I don't do a very good job in presenting it, go check this out and we'll definitely do a much better job. So let's take a very simple example. Everyone's probably configured some software. Your home router, computer, done something. So have you ever thought about how many ways you can configure a piece of software? So let's think biggest number. Someone yell a big number. Three. Three, okay. Three is bigger than some numbers. One million, okay, anything bigger? Whatever the Google number is. All right, well, I didn't hear any of you guys. Your masks are making it hard to hear, sorry. I'll just say you guys said 10 to the 18, which is roughly the estimate of the number of grains of sand in all the beaches in the world. And then someone really clever said 10 to the 80, which is the estimated number of fundamental particles in the observable universe. It's a pretty big number. I mean, more than I could count to. And then we get to a Google, which is a pretty funny number. It's not very useful. That's 10 to 100. Um, it's just a very large number. And then we get to the number of ways you can take a standard install of Windows 10 <laughs> and use GPO to configure. That's a very big number. I don't think there's a name for it. I tried looking for a name for it, and I couldn't figure it out. So we can just call it the Windows 10 number. And I mean, this is not to dig at Microsoft. I mean, a little bit it is, but only a little bit. Um, and this is essentially the same for OS X and Linux. There's thousands of configuration options when you're building a Linux kernel, and then you can go into the whole world of System D. Um, and Mac OS has the same type of complicated P lists and everything. So it's just, it's essentially unreasonably complex. And I use the term unreasonably as a very careful choice of words, is that you cannot reason over that as a person, even if you were going to the grocery store and you wanted an apple and there was 10 to the, even 10 to the 100 types of apples there, you'd be a little overwhelmed. And a computer can't reason over that. I mean, I think 10 to the 80 is a pretty good estimate for like the best automated reasoning. And this is many, many times bigger than that. And that's just for a single computer. 
You plug two of them together and now you've doubled that, right? And then we get to my favorite topic to bash on. I had to do an AI ML thing because that's the hot topic and everyone loves it. And maybe in the future if I go and ask VCs for money, I can say I gave a talk on AI and ML and they'll give me lots of money. But realistically, deep learning, neural nets, they basically take an unknown complex function, like is that a banana or a bicycle? And then they just make an enormously complicated, like four to 8,000 dimension function. So like, you know, X to the 8,000 plus X to the 7,999 and massive data sets. Unfortunately, we don't know what they're learning and generally they're not really learning much other than rote repetition. And we can never understand how they're like reasoning in this high dimensional space. I can reasonably think in three dimensions. Um, that's about it. I can't go to 4,000. And they definitely fail in very strange, surprising, and sometimes very funny ways. So uh, there's a pretty well-known research out there that um, a classifier that was trained, is this a wolf or a dog? They actually dug into it and all it was looking for is there's snow in the background because wolves are generally majestic in the woods with snow and then dogs are a little less majestic laying on the grass or getting belly rubs. And so essentially they spent you know, enormous amounts of compute resources to say is the bottom couple of pixels white or not because that's, that's what it's learned. And we don't understand that unless you spend a lot of time figuring it out. And because lots of VCs are throwing lots of money at that, these things are being integrated into all sorts of systems. And any time you have this chaos machine, it's going to be causing weird faults. Um, you know, they've been mostly comical. There's a great blog post of kind of all of the times when AIs have been trained to play video games and then found like really strange things. Like if you uh, make it a little bit further into a game and then you die, you lose more points. So they just commit suicide before they start playing. And so zero is better than minus points. Um, unfortunately, that's not always the case. Uh, you know, a couple years ago, someone was fatally hit by a self-driving car and killed. Uh, this year, a Tesla drove into a, a tree that I guess jumped out in front of it um, and killed two people. So it's, it's not entirely funny, but it is definitely going to be happening more frequently, I think. So we're all here because we like learning. We have that curiosity. I personally have spent my entire career minus a little bit of AIS doing some, or AWS doing some management looking at research because I think that's the most fun. I can play around, I can like learn something that maybe no one else has ever learned and then it's really cool to like share that and learn other from other people. So how can research beat back that complexity? So I'm proposing divide and conquer. So this is something that actually I proposed a long time ago in a blog post about, I don't know, seven years ago that, you know, there's this multifaceted parts of attacks and a lot of times, myself as a researcher, I just ignore all of the like, parts that make things impactful and focus on what I find to be the most technically interesting. I call these chess problems. I know if you, any of you guys are old enough to remember newspapers, it was like the news but printed out on paper. And if you flip through it, they'd have a little chess board and they'd say like three moves to mate, how do they do it? And you have to kind of reason through this. And so it's a very contrived, you know, contrived constrained problem space and you felt really clever when you figured it out because you're like, hey, if I was ever in this space on TV playing chess against a grandmaster, I can now checkmate that person in three spaces. And that's what I feel like a lot of the research that I've done, I've seen a lot of research. I mean, poker is more about like playing against players, trying to figure out how to use what you have as an advantage. And I think that if we're not really playing the right game, we're never gonna win. And then just to be meta, uh, my boss who wasn't my boss at the time, found my blog post, took a screenshot of it on his keynote at Black Hat, and so I decided to take a screenshot of him presenting my screenshot so I can take a screenshot of this and send it to him because now he's my boss. So that is why that picture is there. Um, so I think we're a little bit more than just chess versus poker. Uh, so I'm gonna just come up with a new thing because it's awesome, chimeras. Um, they're frightening because you have like these crazy DNA research, but the very classical mythical thing, right? So it's a monster that has a head of a lion, a random other head of a goat sticking out of its back, which must be uncomfortable, and then a snake's head for a tail. And so here's the kind of chimera, chimera kind of thesis of attacks, right? So there's kind of three things, right? There's some incentive, right? Attacker 
doesn't get up and be like, you know, I'm just going to do something that I don't want to do, and there's no reason to do it. So there's some incentive. It could be money. There's some way that they get there. It could be physical access. If it's a spy movie, it could be, you know, a huge infrastructure chain. It could be a simple phishing link. So there's some technique, tech, tactics, and procedures to get there. And then lastly, there's like the actual technical means, which is like the, the digital, the exploit or something, right? So uh, when I was working in the government, we just kind of either assume that there was access and so that someone else was dealing with the technical means and we were just trying to figure out how to actually leverage that or vice versa. So they do partition that into these three things and then, you know, the general says, you're going to go and do that. And then we had to kind of figure out, okay, how do we build the infrastructure around that? And then some people, which you can probably guess which three-letter agency it would be, comes up with like a leap zero day or something like that that plugs into this machine. And so this is kind of the, the three pieces that I see. So I think if we can divide, if you can conquer any one of these, if you can slay any one of these heads, you can really kind of decimate your attackers or more importantly, cause them to go after someone else. It's very much like the bear in the woods. If you can outrun someone else, the bear will probably go after the slow person. So you just gotta be faster than someone else. I think these all kind of tie into complexity, right? So if an attacker has an incentive to attack you, they probably will. If they don't, they probably won't. Understanding what their incentives are may be very challenging, but really there's only kind of base incentives that are driven by some human need. And so I would rate that as kind of a low thing. Like you can understand that other people may have incentives. You may not agree with them, but you can probably kind of fathom what they are. Then you get into the TTPs. This can be incredibly complicated, like massive supply chain attacks like you see in the nation state, or very, very simple, like a phishing link. Again, this is something that a human may have designed and built, but it's relatively you know, medium, moderate complexity. And then finally, there's the technical means. Like if you ever read a Google Project Zero, you may need to read it like four times to even figure out like roughly how they turned a one byte overflow into a kernel like Privesk and then you know, manage to print money or something. And so that's a very high complexity because you're playing in the space of software now purely and you don't have any of those physical constraints there. Unfortunately, you, know, so you see a lot of partial efforts which are not trying to slay anyone. They're just like poking the snake in the eye, kicking the, you know, the lion in the chest, and then like yelling at the goat, which doesn't necessarily do very much. So I want to focus on you know, how do you kill one of those three things. So killing snakes, again, they're very hard to empathize and understand, but they're not very complex. And unfortunately, pen testing and red teaming, you've already set their incentives. Their incentives are to get you to pay them and then pay them again in the future. Unfortunately, that doesn't help you here. It definitely helps with the other parts, but you told them what their incentives are on the contract. Is this to build a nice report? Is it to say that there's really nothing wrong here so you can go to your board and say you're happy? Or is it to like scare people and say, yeah, there's a lot of high critical things here. What we're gonna do is we need to invest more in security. But generally, I think there's roughly three-ish incentives, and it can be a mishmash depending on who you are, right? There's, you know, some state secrets, stealing intelligence, IP, IP theft, um, which is kind of what you see at the very high level, kind of the targeted attacks. Um, you see money, which is a pretty big one, you know, ransomware, other types of things, um, and then causing havoc or damage. And I think it's interesting because I have some examples of this. So a friend of mine was a CISO at a, a hedge fund, and someone breached their network and they were like, oh shit, like we have literally billions of dollars of financial information on this network. And the attacker looked at it and said, hmm, and went over and stole their UPS account number so that they could steal or they like to ship stuff for free. So they were entirely motivated by money and it's honestly a lot of work to understand the whole hedge fund thing, so I get it. But they were motivated by that, so they left billion dollars on the table to probably spend like three thousand dollars in free UPS and FedEx I guess. Also the same thing with, with havoc and damage. It's definitely a scary thing that the press likes to talk about like hackers were going to blow up a power plant or something and certainly they could but generally they don't. Um, I still think that there is some humanity left in everyone and that's like a step that's a lot further and also you know, that would cause a pretty serious um, reprisal from whichever government or you know, organization is behind defending that. And I think there was some interesting work by Charles Perrin uh, who he basically set up a fake factory 
So it was a full ICS SCADA environment that had, you know, actual, you know, actuators, all the components of a factory. It had an IT environment that had multiple people and users and the whole thing. And then it also had like a fake company. So it was registered with Google Maps. You could actually look at these people. He had like the nice shining, you know, smiling pictures of all their board members and everything. And then he let it out on the internet and just kind of left it there for months and months and months. And what was interesting is he got ransomware like every day. And then people were leaving notes on his computer being like, Mike, who was a fictional person in charge of IT, is an idiot. Don't have him work for you anymore because it was so easy to hack you guys. But what was interesting is after all of those months, no one jumped to the trivially accessible factory and started causing any physical havoc. I mean, realistically, they were driven by money and there was no one that was like, I'm gonna go blow up a factory in the Midwest today, which I think is good. I think that's good. Um, so understanding what kind of thing you are, and that depends a lot on your organization. I think there are some clever ways that you might be able to disrupt or change those incentives. Um, but generally, if you're hated by the North Koreans, there's not too much you could do at the end of the day. So looking at kind of goats, right? So the complexity here, again, is it's human generated. You can generally fathom how they're gonna do it. They're gonna have some you know, infrastructure on their side. They're gonna have some infrastructure in kind of gray space or like you know, they pop some poor grandmother's computer and they use that to pivot through. And so you can generally reason about how that's gonna look. You can, you can model that. And unfortunately, this is actually, well, fortunately for us, this is one of the areas where attacker infrastructure is just as fragile as the defenders, right? DARPA had this huge push to move from the notion of a kill chain to like a kill web, which sounds pretty horrifying either way, but they were worried that someone would be able to break just one link in that attacker chain, and then they wouldn't be able to deliver their payload, which in this case was probably a bomb. So they had to come up with this nice like mesh warfare, mosaic warfare. And so that's actually nice because if DARPA is spending hundreds of millions of dollars doing it, Generally, attackers probably don't have those resources to build a highly redundant attack system that is like they can just spin up and just waste those resources on every random person they're going to attack. And then if you can break their CAN TTPs and then force them to be like, oh, now I need to like hand jam this for them, they're going to get really irritated and they're going to go look for a slower person to go eat. I think also what's interesting with TTPs is humans here are very explicitly part of this network. Um, you know, in some cases, they're legally mandated to do some things. So if you can put them in a situation where they have to follow something, um, you can like kind of use them to jump air gaps. But also, they're the people who are going to be clicking on, you know, phishing links and those types of things. So again, if you can figure out how to use your humans to disrupt those chains, you can put them on their back foot, increase their paranoia. And then finally, I think the biggest one is the research one is interesting is the taming the lions, right? That's looking at the technical means, the code, the whole world of, of security that a lot of the research comes through. Um, and here, the complexity, again, is unreasonable. We can't imagine the state space of a very simple program, let alone a distributed system. I mean, I've seen some crazy stuff um, from the Langsec world where they have found Turing completeness in the most bizarre of places. So the Intel CPU's memory management without ever running and exec uh, executing a single instruction is actually Turing complete. You can play any, you know, program any game to it um, and it will run just by the page fault logic. Uh, the BGP routing network is a distributed Turing machine. So by setting up certain routes and making certain requests, you can actually, ar you know, arbitrarily execute on this distributed network. And I think someone did that to make the routing tables of the world look like nine cat kind of going across, if you look through the historical changes, someone just basically, you know, benignly made nine cat just kind of float through the ether. Um, another one is there's a tool called Mofiscator, which lets you compile any software, any C or C++ code, to the only one assembly instruction, move. So the move instruction, which is supposed to just copy memory from one place to another, is so powerful that you can recompile to only move instructions. Now, it's a lot of move instructions, but that's still just these complexities kind of creep up. And so being able to, you know, limit that is very, very challenging in this world. So you get your classic security hygiene. You have AppSec, hardening, segmentation. I think what's really important is, is that, you know, us is really important. Buying a vendor's tool is great, but unless you have people who can make that, you know, integrated into your environment, um, or be able to make that dynamic to respond to what's happening, the tool itself is never going to be as smart as us. And so I think that's also where I think some of my disdain for AI and ML is, is that unless it's tailored to your environment, 
and like you know that you run some billing batch process every quarter, the machine learning thing doesn't know that. And so unless you can tailor it, which requires a lot of human effort, it's never gonna be as good as like some smart guys on the keyboard, or gals on the keyboard. And then you can actively frustrate attackers. And then you get into the world, which I think is a lot of what we're seeing, is, is complexity facing complexity. So that's, you know, adding a lot of diversity, you know, ASLR, we've seen some even better things than ASLR. And then you get into this bot versus bot of who can spend more money, you know, the attacker or um, the, uh, the defender. And that can work, I think. Um, that was kind of the strategy, I think, uh, between the U.S. and the Soviet Union of let's just make them spend an unreasonable amount of money and then they'll give up. But it doesn't always work if you're being attacked by um, well-funded adversaries. So I think, again, I wanted to bring this back. It's about complexity, the ultimate lion. And I think if you look at it, you know, the actual, the, the real gains you get are from reducing complexity. Making things simpler generally works better. I had a pro program at DARPA looking at building um, uh, like guaranteed or provably correct machine learning uh, primitives. And they weren't as powerful as what there was, but they were actually like, they would not get deceived by any type of, um, of, of malicious input. And that was done actually, a lot of the techniques were by reducing the complexity of the network to reduce the function to something that more closely matched the process they were modeling. And I think, you know, it's the ultimate line as well is there's market forces. It's way cheaper for someone to go build a generic CPU or a microcontroller that costs, I don't know, three cents or something to make and then have software do it rather than building a custom ASIC for something. And then you end up with literally hundreds of computers in your computer. I, when I, the more I learn into low level security, the more bonkers it is that it even turns on, right? You have, you know, I learned just the other week that your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth um, chip radio, which is one chip, has multiple processors, an out-of-band management port because they share the same RFID or RF frequencies. And so if the Bluetooth is saying, oh, I'm gonna send something, it goes to the Wi-Fi over this unmanaged, unknowable channel that's built into the silica and says, hey, Wi-Fi, I'm gonna be transmitting, so to, like, be careful. And then they actually talk, and so there's actually some exploits now that if you can break the Bluetooth, or the Wi-Fi, you can jump across between those two. And so that's just one radio in one chip that's like, my watch has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on it, my phone has that, and then there's the memory controllers, which are already Turing complete, there's the CPU, which has multiple CPUs in it, memory cards, micro SD cards have uh, Atmel 8-bit MCUs in them that you can break the firmware, and, and so it's all over the place, and it's again, it's driven to be um, it's because it's cheaper than custom fit, you're going to have to be fighting this all across your organization. And I think that if we can tame the line of complexity, that's where we'll see gains in security. And I think you see that in things like formal methods. So formal methods is based on proof that something is operating correctly or not operating incorrectly. And that requires the fact that you have to be able to reason over that state space. And so that limits things to roughly that 10 to the 80 state space. And once you can get this, so that's basically a check to make sure you've done all the work up front, which is kind of reducing that uh, simplicity. But that's very, very expensive. Uh, it's roughly $150 million to formally verify 50,000 lines of code um, for the highest. So FAA flight controllers have to be certified as life critical. So you need to spend however much it costs to write 50,000 lines of code, and then $150 million for people to verify that that code will not kill people. That is very high expense. But uh, unfortunately, that's kind of where we're at right now. And a lot of the security automations of fuzzings and all these uh, you know, fuzzers, symbolic execution, is just using additional complexity to try to check complexity. So you fuzz for millions of CPU hours, you're just hoping that you're going to kind of bound that state space of a program through random mutations. Formal methods is the same thing, but through mathematical principles. Um, and you're just spending more and more time on that trying to do it rather than taking a step back and figuring out how we can reduce that complexity. So looking at the research, um, uh, I just worry that if we spend so much time doing these chess problems, we're gonna end up kind of marginalizing ourselves and you know not supporting the people that we actually should be because we're so focused on this like really leaked you know one byte overflow that turns into a kernel privest 
and not helping solve people's problems of today. So I think it still resonates, and you know, I think yeah, I see this you know, today even. So that was from seven years ago. Uh, one of the things I do at Thinks, we just released a thing called Thinkscapes. Um, it's free, uh, thinks.com slash ts. Basically, me and our team, we read every abstract presentation paper of every conference in the world. Um, so, and we release every quarter. So there are 277 security talks between August 15th and November 15th, and they have all these talks. And we go through all of them, and we look for things that are interesting, and we also look for things that are kind of like maybe the start of the next trend. <clears throat> So I see a lot of content out there, and I also see not a lot of needle moving in some cases. And I think a lot of that comes either we're trying to slay all of the heads, but not quite succeeding, and so we don't slay any of them. Or we're trying to compete solely in very high complexity without, with limited resources. And it come, comes back to the, the scale and the ability and what resources you have. If you're an individual contributor versus you know, the defense and industrial base with your, your many millions. I think that's looking back at my career it was figuring out what battles to invest in to still be successful, I'm maybe successful. So, going back to the who am I in my career, so at AIS, you know, one of the things we built was a custom BIOS that just assumes that whatever the state of the system was before it was there was bad. And we just wiped it all down and we wrote drivers to directly talk to the hard drive, to the display, and load any operating system. Um, and so basically any pre-boot malware was there, hopefully wasn't there after that. Um, and that really attacked the TTPs, so that was kind of that moderate complexity. And again, this was like the two dollar bills if we go back to that first slide. So, you know, a couple million dollars, this was a team of however many people over months. And then I got into DARPA and I was like, all right, well now here's just one of my projects, was take incoming binaries or source code, lift them up to LLVM intermediate representation, Diversify them, so maybe in one variant the stack grows up, the other the stack grows down, or maybe in one there is no stack whatsoever. And then you run them in parallel to find an exploit at the time of exploitation, because they are semantically equivalent, and we spent a lot of time proving that, but structurally diverse. So if they start behaving differently, it is because someone is attacking the structure. So that was an enormous project, focusing on the technical means of how exploits work in various classes of attacks. But that was a huge amount of resources that I had to play with at the time. And I got to AWS, like looking for bugs, finding and fixing bugs in open source and then reporting them upstream, getting them fixed for everyone. Um, technical means again, but I could just spend as much money as I wanted on fuzzers um, and formal verification and symbolic execution. Um, if you aren't aware, AWS does have a lot of computers. And so I could use a lot of those for that kind of thing. Again, so I'm focusing on technical means. And now at Thinks, or Thinks Labs, which is, again, that one deadbeat engineer of me, um, now I'm looking at the incentives, because that's the simplest. And generally, as you all know, I'm pretty lazy. And so I want to think of what's the easiest thing I can do that can still have some, some value. And so this is like looking at how I can turn offensive tricks that are pretty simple into defensive things. So now an attacker may not be incentivized to go and grab that data and start pouring through it, because they don't know if it's actually, you know, kind of this canary token or honey data or things like that. And so if we can attack that incentive, then we have a chance of being successful for a relatively low investment. I think this thing is like a few hours of my time. So looking at that specifically, this was, again, a couple hours of my time. I found uh, someone sent me a MySQL dump file that had some conference data in it. I opened it up and it was, I don't know, maybe 40 megabytes, so I was not looking at that in Emacs or VI. Um, so I imported it into a Docker container running MySQL, did some queries, got some stats, it was great. And I was curious, like, how would you be able to figure out if someone was doing this? If someone had dumped your database, loaded it up, and was poking around in your production payment information. So I kind of was thinking about that, and so I looked up, okay, well, this is essentially an exfiltration technique. I just need to be able to exfiltrate some data. And so I looked in all the, like, the attacker blogs and you know, there's some, some cool work out there, actually. Um, there's uh, something called Data Thief, which uh, was Cesar Sil Silvario, um, who did against Oracle. So basically, he used some of the Java bindings in Oracle to basically bootstrap a networking stack and then be able to exfiltrate data from SQL. Uh, the Thinks guys, back in the day, they did similar things for MS or MSSQL, where they were able to like break out and actually do some kind of shell commands and send data out. 
And so really, this is like a blind SQL injection. Say you can, you can execute SQL injection against a database server, but they scrape all the errors so you can't see what's happening here. This is a way that really what you can do is then just use SQL to be able to send it out to a, another server. So I started looking at, um, for my SQL replication, um, I was happy to discover that you can turn on and configure replication directly through SQL. And so I set up a listening post on one of my servers, and then the server that I was attacking would reach out to that one. Um, it actually didn't do anything, it just connected and didn't do anything. So I was lazy again, as I mentioned, and we only have one deadbeat engineer. Um, so I just copied a real handshake in Wireshark that worked, copied those bytes, and then just echoed them in Python, and then sure enough, it sent, in this case, a username from the server, which I could set when I was configuring it. And so I built like one stored procedure in SQL, let me send the contents of a table. So I just say send, you know, password database table, um, and it would just send it out. It's pretty slow, uh, 315 bytes per second, or bits per second, sorry, um, but definitely enough to grab some password hashes. So that's the offensive trick. Turning that around now, if you look at it in defense, can we embed these types of things into either production databases or MySQL database dumps that we're leaving on our, our own infrastructure? that then call home. So we have a couple fake databases out there on canarytokens.org for free. You know, I think we have a HR one and maybe a payments one, or we can just give you the commands you can embed in your own SQL dumps if you'd like. And if any attacker does the basic thing of import this SQL, it then sends you an email saying, hey, this person, this IP address, just opened it up. So you might want to check on that. And so this is, again, now, now we're looking at the incentive, right? So an attacker wants to go and steal data that's useful and probably not be detected. We're now playing with that. I think it would have been very interesting because the thing is with deception is you don't actually have to be deceptive to be deceptive. You just have to tell people you are. So if after the Snowden leaks, the NSA had all these PowerPoints out there with all these horrible things they were doing, if they had just said, oh, yeah, but every Friday we have a drinking game, where we come up with absurd sounding code names, silly projects, and we put them in the same folder, but only we know which ones are real, that would have definitely changed the incentive there because now you don't know if you know, one third or one half of those things really existed. And you don't actually have to do it, you can just tell people you're doing it. I think uh, looking at the dark market, one of the most valuable pieces of information out there is someone's health records through a very convoluted series of, of trades that ends up coming out uh, to pharmaceutical companies to do market research because they want to know, if, should I invest money in, in building a drug for people with sore toes and you know twitchy ears? Let's go and figure that out. It's a lot cheaper to, through a complicated set of things, look at breached hospital records rather than it is to you know, have surveys and ask people. Now imagine if every hospital has 10,000 fake patients in there that have, you know, probably unrealistic and silly things, but you won't know that unless you're a doctor looking at it. So now you say, oh yeah, you can, you can use that data for your market research, but I would bet billions of dollars on that because perhaps as much as two thirds or however much you want to invest in that may be fake unless you look at this with a doctor and every single record. So I think you can change their incentives by attacking the value that they're going to get from that. So I think we can win. If we can slay the head of any of these chimeras, the whole beast will die. I hope that's mythologically accurate. I don't actually know. I didn't read any old stories to make sure that's the case, doesn't grow back or something. I think, again, us and the tools that we build ourselves allow us to scale our own complexity and our speed at which we can reason about complexity. And then we can you know, basically allow us to then go and attack their attack chains because that's the fragile part. I think it'd be really fun to make attackers stressed and paranoid as we are. And I think we can actually drive revenue, not only cost. I've seen this happen a couple places. One is, is this analogy that security is like the brakes in a really fast car. Uh, there's a conference in Germany called Troopers, and one of the speaker perks is they pick you up in like this absurd Audi Mercedes thing, and you go on the Autobahn, and then they just hit the speed limiter. And it's pretty fun until like a Peugeot pulls out doing like 60 miles an hour and you're doing 200. Um, then you realize that the reason that that car can go so fast is because those brakes work over time. 
And so the security can allow people to do crazy stuff. So SIM cards, the security of the physical SIM cards allow people to kind of trust that they can put out mobile phones for very cheap and all this kind of stuff. So you can, you can drive revenue by allowing more business risks. I've actually seen companies that have successful security programs. They acquired so many companies, they got so used to doing security for a hodgepodge of random stuff, they just started offering that as a service. So other companies, they pivoted into becoming an MSSP because they were already doing it for you know, a worldwide consortium of 200 small companies they bought. They figured, why not charge other people and do the same thing? So now they're actually generating revenue rather than being a cost center, which is you know, a good way to get more resources to play with more fun stuff. So, kind of in conclusion, if we can understand their incentives, if we can target their TTPs, and then lastly, you know, the technical needs I think are the most fun, but they do require the highest amount of resources, you can provide a pretty good return on your investment. If you're trying to make partial progress in the multiple games you're playing with attackers, you may result in losses across the board. And I think there's really cool research out there, I mean, again, uh, not to, to you know, kind of shout the, the free thing, but there's really cool research. I've really enjoyed reading thousands of talks every quarter because there's people doing some crazy stuff and there's a lot more work that can be done out there. And you can really move the resource, the needle even when you don't have tons of resource. Like I feel like, you know, probably the two hours I spent building a canary token may actually frustrate or catch an attacker, whereas the $65 million I spent at DARPA that unfortunately has never been deployed, this is so complicated and difficult to use, will probably not stop anyone. And so you, if you can target your resources to your strengths, you can probably do some pretty cool stuff. And then if you're building anything, so if there's people here who are developers, looking at complexity as a cost when you're designing software. And then that way you can really track it and figure out how you can isolate complexity from the business or safety critical functions. All of those ransomware attacks that took out the meat processing and the other, the, the pipeline, those were not targeting their OT systems. They had just co-mingled the billing process with that function, business critical function. And so then when the billing system got taken down, it then trickled on and caused that kind of knock-on effect. Realize that, I know this is very, uh, very uh, sacrilegious to say, but AI and ML is not a panacea unless you are asking for VC funding, in which case, slather that all over your deck. And it can fail in really like weird ways, so limit these failures, right? Assume that thing is gonna fail in the worst possible case, and then try to make sure that it doesn't act on that. And then, if you are in a high complex environment, just double down on that, right? So fuzzing software as part of your CI CD pipeline, you're exposing software, you know, your own internal software to complexity. You've been, you know, it could just be an, an idiot user typing the wrong thing, or it could be an attacker. Doing adversarial training of AI and ML is just basically giving it attack type inputs to see what happens, and then it can learn, oh, this is actually bogus, this is, you know, noise or something. And then we always see the kind of the chaos monkey, right? So um, Netflix has processes that run through their networks, turning off servers, crashing daemons, all sorts of stuff, injecting chaos so they can build resilient systems. And they have different types of monkeys. They have like gibbons and gorillas. And I think the most powerful one actually just goes and like yanks the power to an entire data center. And can they still stream all the video and all the content to everyone if they lose an entire data center, which is pretty amazing. Um, and that's looking at these distributed systems. So, again, yeah, actually not that many people left, which either means you're very comfortable in those chairs, um, or thank you very much. Uh, I have some time for questions, but please give me feedback, conference feedback, anything else feedback. Um, I think I have about 15 minutes for questions if people want to. Uh, if not, it's awesome to be here. Thank you so much for your time, and I uh, look forward to the rest of the day. Fantastic.